for the invitation. Uh, a lot of fun to be here. Uh, as, as you know, everything is very different nowadays, so uh, hopefully this talk will also reflect that as well. I specifically designed it for this residency in particular. And uh, good to see everybody here. Um, so, by the way, I really wanted to be, uh, you know, very, like, uh, interactive uh, in this. Uh, so, uh, do feel free to stop and, you know, just chat, you know, through this. Because I think, you know, uh, talks are only good when they're, like, kind of communication devices, right? So, if it's just me going on over and over... Uh, it, you know, it's, it's, it's not, it's not super helpful. So, so do feel free to, you know, just stop me. And I think the easiest way is just like unmute and unmute and just yell, you know, cause I can't really see everything all the time. So, um, yeah. So having said that, um, uh, I'll, I'll begin cause I do have a lot of slides, but, uh, uh they, they are kind of tailored to you. Um, so, um, I just want to begin by just quickly introducing myself. Um, I'm an artist, uh, performer. Uh, I've done a few things, but uh, I came from Parsons Design Technology. Um, I also, right before that, uh, did my uh, PhD in neuroscience at UCLA. So I was funded by you know National Science Foundation, NIH, etc. And then since then, though, I've been doing um, residencies and also other work, uh, exhibitions, museums. Uh, and then I was lucky enough to also participate in performance, for example, with Kat uh, uh, in the other group. Uh, um, her uh, uh, group called Edge Cut, I performed there as well. Um, and currently I'm a, a professor, assistant professor at City University of Hong Kong School of Creative Media. So today's uh, talk uh, will be um, a combination of what I am doing and what I did and also I wanted to just give you some flavor about um, um, some of the pedagogy pedagogy and and the viewpoint that I'm coming from which is basically understanding the psychology uh, behind um, performance uh, in some ways um, so those two bolded items right there narratives by performance psychodynamics of interaction are my very short attempt to uh, Give you guys some insight behind um, uh, that aspect of things. Um, so, by the way, this is what I really do uh, for fun. So, <laughs> I love to dance. Uh, I do this thing called uh, Casino Rada. Does anybody know about uh, Cuban Rada Salsa? So, it's kind of this group of people. And it's choreographed in such a way that um, you know the moves beforehand, but the moves are synchronized with, be, between everybody in the group. So I love to be the person who's calling the moves. And you can call the moves using by voice or by gestures, right? And when you call the move, you know, for example, there's a the famous move is called Dame, which means give me. And when you call Dame, everybody switches to the next partner. So, um, anyways, I um, that's my specialty in that, and I choreograph for that. And the fun thing with the choreography, choreography for that is, you don't choreograph for the actual action, right? It's not planned. You choreograph for intuitive actions. So you, everybody learns all the different actions, and then you, it's up to your call to make sense of what that, you know, is. And it has to make sense in the context of the music and when it happens, right? Like you have to call on the three to be the next one, you know, for instance. Anyway, so, so this is fun stuff. Um, anyways, uh, before I start, any comments in general? Uh, thoughts, ideas? If you can hear me. Of uh, chance procedures and uh, general, like John Cage or um how they were also just given a list of actions and by chance calling different actions and building the piece based on that so it reminded of that as well yeah for sure yeah but john cage is kind of inspiration in that realm yeah yeah and i think this case is also interesting in that like you have to time it with the music correctly right it looks like when you first start calling uh it, it's it's kind of off because people be like wait are you calling for the next one, two, three, or are you calling for this one, two, three, right? 
uh, it's pretty fun. Uh, I recommend it. Uh, looking at YouTube, uh, searching for Casino Reina. Uh, it's pretty fun. I actually specifically went to Cuba, by the way, in a city called Camagüe, to actually learn that with these little kids. Uh, this is why Cubans are so great at dancing, because little kids learn this when they're like, you know, you know, all my all my classmates are like these, you know, teenagers, you know, so it's, it was fun. As a fan myself of like folklorica and like uh, folk dances in general, I love using the logic and the forms of folk dance. Um, like thinking of that, like as a elevated art form and using that in our own stuff. Mm. I appreciate that nod to folk dance. Yeah, I think there's a lot of collaborative uh, things across different medium that could that could fit together too, right? Interesting stuff. Yeah. So uh, very quickly, I'll go over um, sort of, you know, some of the things that drives my approach. So that's kind of better uh, way to understand uh, maybe how the work flows from that. So the first thing I want to talk about very briefly is basically the idea that um, performance in general is kind of like a story, right? You're always telling a story, right? So, um, but I'm going to tell you from a perspective that you probably haven't heard from as much, and which is from the psychology point of view, the neuroscience point of view. This is kind of from my scientific work as well, um, inspirations from it. So stories are behind everything we do. Um, so the interesting thing is though, the same story can actually do two, you know, different things. So for example, this, uh, this example is uh, someone telling me a story that, oh, you know, my dad used to throw me in the water in order to, you know, uh, teach me how to swim, right? So the, 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 the purpose of that or the, or, the, or the takeaway from that is like, well, because of that, you know, he was able to train me to, you know, overcome risks and, and you know, and, and all kinds of, you know, disasters to actually create the business that I have now, for instance. That's one interpretation of the story. Another interpretation of the story could be like, despite my dad being this tyrant and throwing me into the water, I was able to learn and fight authority and like overcome uh, these, uh, uh, you know, um, authority figures, right? So the same story actually told from a different point of view are giving you different um, flavors of the story, right? Behind different goals and purposes. So uh, what's really important, though, uh, from the psychological perspective is that people in general edit their stories, right? Like you tell the story, uh, that's not the actual story. It's just an interpretation of the story. Um, so when I tell you about my dancing, I show you all the beautiful pictures, you know, that's what I want you to believe on the right side. But of course, you actually watch me dancing out there. You know, it's going to some, look something on the left. You're kind of like geeky guy and try to, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know. Still having fun, but um, so the the outcome of the story is very different from um, the story that uh, we're trying uh, that that we imagine in ourselves. Right. So the stories are under our kind of influence, but interestingly, the stories also influence us. So the other direction of this um, psychology, and and that comes up uh, all the time. But for instance, um, if you write down, you know, when you're in high school, I want to be a doctor. Uh, you write that sketch down and then you dream about it and you you kind of uh, think more and more about what kind of things you could do uh, to help people and etc cetera, etc cetera. well that story actually changes your mind as well it it forms the neural circuits that allows you to actually believe more and more into this and and then that story then basically kind of commits us to something that we haven't firmly established yet Right. So you can see that there's kind of this bi-directional influence, right? We influence our, the stories we tell, but the, sto the stories we tell actually influence what we do as well, what we commit to as well. Um, so uh, what I wanted to, you know, you know, say was just like, you know, we're always under the influence of stories, but not, not only that, but also these narratives also lead to additional interactions. This is... Uh, uh, work that I did at uh, uh, New York Hall of Science. So we, we gave the uh, kids mostly an opportunity to dress up to escape uh, uh, the uh, computer vision based camera. They actually end up doing all these interesting new things because of the story 
uh, that we were telling. So. Okay, so uh, just real quickly, because I guess um, I know this is going to be kind of long. So I just want to tell you about um, stuff that I have done, you know, in terms of art and science. And we can talk more as, as um, in the individual time. Uh, you know, I do a lot of work with machines and machine learning and uh, spatial interactions. Uh, today, I won't talk about that. Okay, so the two main projects I want to talk about, um, if we have time, I can talk about the other two, which are, um, you know, I can also talk about in the, in the future. But the main two that I want to talk about is one, the skin of our sheath, which is a work that I did with a, a Japanese dancer. Um, and this is for the edge cut uh, work that um, uh, we did. Uh, so this is also presented in other places. Um, she's from Perry Dance, so it's a collaboration with uh, those guys pre presenting it at TEI. Um, so, um, what kind of image comes into your mind when you see somebody wearing a headset but actually doing a dance uh, performance? Um, you know, moves like this. What kind of, does it kind of bring up certain types of images that, uh, I mean, I'm guessing some of you are kind of would be wondering uh, what they're actually seeing inside, right? Because you're not seeing what they're seeing inside. Um, so this is kind of the idea that we're getting across in this uh, project is that a lot of times when you look at someone who's in VR, you, um, you know, first thing is you s figure out because they're wearing a headset, like what the heck are they doing in there, right? Like what kind of interesting interaction is happening in there? And when you see dance movement coming from the outside of that, you wonder what world is happening inside. That's kind of the wonder that that we're getting at um, in this um, uh, particular uh, project. So in the canonical view, um, so this is kind of like uh, things that's happening in VR, performance in VR. So you would have an observer and a performer. Uh, they're sitting at home in their different places, but they're both inside a VR world. For example, Alt Space VR or Second Life, you know, any of those, you know, Mozilla Hubs. Right? So you have a common view of what the performer is doing inside VR. Right? You're seeing their virtual world. In this case, basically what we want to do was, use, you know, thinking from the psychological perspective, to understand what if the two people, what if the observer and the performer are in the same physical space. So in this case, this was uh, in uh, New Inc, um, New Museum. Uh, but one uh, character is in their own virtual world and so therefore the, the observer has to have a model of what uh, it, they think is happening in the virtual world that this performer is doing right so it's a it's a different perspective from what you would expect uh, VR performance to be so inside of VR you have the same story there's not it's kind of predictable you're just kind of you're connecting the people together in our um, performance we're outside of VR, so there's something happening in the VR. Um, so there's a mismatch between what the person is doing in this dance space and then in what she's actually doing inside the VR world. Uh, so this is kind of uh, the setup for this. Um, so we have a projector set up that's for after the performance. So during the performance, uh, you can see on the uh, lower left there, that's a 360 photo of uh, Mizuho uh, performing on the lower left there. You can kind of barely see that. Um, and then people are, you know, gathered around seeing what's happening. And then after the performance, we actually show what she's actually doing in the dancing. So she looks like she's dancing and we, you know, practice this a lot because it has to be right. Um, but, um, but as she's dancing, she's actually creating inside tilt brush, this uh, garment basically for the person who's standing in the back. So basically the idea is she's actually constructing something functional during this kind of quote unquote dance. Um, I'll show you uh, guys separately what the dance looks like um, uh, because I think um, we're probably going to run out of time a little bit. But the dance looks really like a dance performance. It doesn't look like she's building or constructing any, anything. And that's by design. That's trained, um, you know, so that it looks completely like a dance perfectly. But actually, she's actually building that. So we actually have multiple performances. So therefore, you know, these different... Uh, garments actually gets built and some of them are bigger and some are smaller because the audience members some of them are bigger and some are smaller right? um, so anyway so uh, I can show you this uh, 
you know, if we have time in the Q and A or whatever, uh, in the uh, the actual YouTube video, but that's already published, right? So, you know, so I'm not going to show that to you right now. Um, so the other uh, main project uh, I want to talk about is another project from 2020. It's called Decertify. Oh, by the way, before we move on, there's any any comments, questions, anything about this um, VR based work in particular? Yeah, does the does the person that is having the garment constructed around them know that they're having a garment constructed around them? Are they a part of the performance or was it like someone in the audience? Uh, we did it two different ways. So the one way is the first way that you you you, you said. Basically, I had a, a, a com, you know compatriot in the in the in the performance who, unlike everybody who was sitting down, she was standing up and in the back. And then what uh, Mizuho did was when she entered, she entered and then faced that person who sent standing in the back, basically. So it was kind of a construction for her. And so afterwards, she's also the first one to put on the headset to see what the garment would be like. Um, so the projector is also in a way to show what the garment looks like. And that's kind of really hard to show in Zoom and in video form even, right? Because you have to kind of be there to, to see what it looks like and feels like. Um, something like Mozilla Hubs would work for that. But, um, uh, but yeah, so, so basically it's designed for that person, but we also had a, a, a next iteration where uh, there wasn't any other compatriot that was available. So I just asked somebody in the audience, um, can you just stand up? And then the thought was that she was kind of designing for that person as well. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned at the beginning that uh, there is a difference between what the performers is seeing in VR and what they're actually doing. So I'm interested in terms of that and how the garment comes in, because the garment, I, I understand she's building it in VR too, right? Yeah. yeah. So how it all comes together and it, in which parts? Yeah, yeah, great question. I know this is kind of complicated. So, so, um, so on the outside performance, I, maybe I'll show you the video after, you know, we get out of this PowerPoint thing, but, um, but in, in the performance, all you can see is someone who's dancing. Okay. So you're wondering probably all the time. You're just wondering, Hmm, I wonder what she's actually seeing, right? Must be some amazing environment. She's dancing around like, cause she, she's doing all these really funky, interesting stuff. Right. So, so that's one side. So the inside, um, she's actually starting from scratch with nothing and building that garment over time, right? So for example, she has the, uh, she has both of the joysticks there, right? But she has to make the joystick look like she's not using it in some ways because mm -hmm. she's actually using the joystick to actually you know, choose, you know, choose my... Uh, color, right? She's just switching the colors, right? <laughs> During all this, right? Switching the color and then using it to draw, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, so there's something, but the point though is that she's doing something inside that you don't have access to and you wouldn't think that she would be building a garment out of it. That's kind of a surprise for the audience that she can see later on. Does, does that sort of get at the question? Um, maybe I'm not answering it in the way that you're expecting. No, no, I understand. Yeah, I got it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it'll be probably it probably makes more sense when we get out of this and then kind of show you very briefly a clip of what it looks like, because um, there is a way to show both of them, you know, as she's drawing and uh, as she's dancing uh, inside of VR and outside at the same time, and that will kind of make more sense. Yeah, but the audience doesn't know that until the very very end when we actually show you know, the projected image and then allow whoever wants to, to put on the headset to actually look at what she just created like right now. So it is a performance in a way that it, she just creates that from scratch, but it's rehearsed very well, right? So we, you know, met, did that many times to make sure that it works because there's also a time limit on it as well. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Um, okay, so uh, the second project I also just brief touch touch briefly about because I, I do want to spend time talking about some of the things that, you know, it doesn't really help you as much maybe just looking at what other people have done. I wanted to 
give you guys some concepts, you know, from psychology of performance and things like that that might be able to help you in the future. So uh, the next project is also from 2020. It's called Decertify. Um, uh, Mizuho is in this as well, but it's also working with another artist named Ting Ting Chan. Um, so this is a uh, work that we showed at different places, Arts Electronica. Burning Man, which is in VR this year, <laughs> was in VR this year, uh, etc. Um, so this comes starting from, you know, a thing that most of us probably have experienced these days is being stuck in a room uh, with nothing except to sometimes look at yourself in the mirror, sometimes look at yourself in Zoom, right? <laughs> you guys know how uh, frustrating that can be. I don't need to remind you. I think that single GIF maybe kind of already captures that. Um, but the point of this project, the starting point is to, and the, the reason it's called Decertify, is to say, don't deal with uncertainty. Love the uncertainty that is changing us, right? So it's from the perspective, it's like, it's not about adapting to the future. It's actually about loving the thing that changes our routine and changes what we're doing. Um, and then in, in terms of the preaching, right, I'll give you some of that. Um, and the idea was that uncertainty, what, it, what is it like to live under these uncertain times? Uh, in some sense, it's about giving without receiving. Um, it's also about imagining things without seeing, right? Um, you're not seeing the real person with presence in front of you. You have to imagine that. Um, um, and then it's also about just trusting without knowing for certain, right? You don't know what's going to happen uh, economically, et cetera, et cetera. You just have to trust that you're going to get through it, for instance. Right? So uh, it's just a video work, uh, but here are the rules that we kind of set up for ourselves in this video work, right? Uh, the key thing is kind of one, two, three. So one is we're each going to be at our home uh, in, uh, and making film segments on our own. And then we're going to put it together um, uh, in the editing process without knowing what other people have kind of filmed. Um, and then it has to be entirely in one's room and there's no uh, social media, news, whatever for that day, basically, right? So we're stuck in our room making uh, a movie about it. And then we want it to be as expressive as possible of our current state. So there were put, I would we put things in there that's very personal. Some of it is actually uh, has a lot of tension, kind of sexual as well, because we're kind of stuck and we, we can't get out and, you know, we want to express ourselves. Um, and again, I'll show you the video at least briefly um, for the outcome of that. But, but the outcome is it's just a video that we, you know, then showed in different places, right? And it kind of crisscrosses between our three different worlds, basically. And until the very end, when it kind of, the three different worlds kind of merge together, because we're all outside and then kind of in a surprising turn of events at the end, it kind of comes together. Not super surprising, but, you know, just kind of the narrative flow of it. Uh, like, I, like I said, uh, you know, it's a little long too. I don't know if I can show the whole thing, but it's on, it's on my website as well if you wanted to. Um, if you want to like look at, the video as as this is happening you can also go to raylc.org these two projects are the the ones on the upper left which are kind of the the latest anyhow um so anyway so um uh so in terms of the presentation because you know that's kind of the things that uh you guys would be interested in, in terms of okay like where are we going to present this what kind of venues that would be different and how it would change how you present it so we presented in a few places um RC Electronica, uh, Global Edition or whatever it's called, uh, is very interesting. Uh, they have it all always available, right? So it's always available, so you're streaming it anytime you want. But of course, you, as you guys know, some of some of the work uh, which, you know, applying for this kind of Cyber Dreams uh, folks at Burning Man is timed to when you want to present it. And it's pretty different uh, having it available all the time versus uh, having it timed so that it feels like a performance as well uh, if it's only possible you know at certain times for the screening so that's also something to think about um, and that's you know kind of still uh, happening right now um, anyway so yeah if you want to go see the film you can you can do that um, I can also show it a little bit in the Q&A perhaps um, any questions about this work I know 
you're not really seeing it, so it's hard to um, do that. But you can also go on the RayLC.org um, and check out little snippets of that on YouTube. Okay, um, yeah, again, uh, feel free to interrupt, interrupt if you have any suggestions. So, um, so instead of just talking about my work for like the whole time, which maybe some of you were expecting, uh, you know, because it's on the web already, you know, you can just check that out anytime. It doesn't, doesn't need me to, you know, speak for itself. I don't need to be talking about it. So, um, so instead of that, I think the rest of the time that I have available before, you know, just interacting with you uh, in about, you know, 20 minutes, 25 minutes or so uh, individually or, you know, in, the, in this group, excuse me, uh, is that I'll give you a quick primer. And this is not, um, this is not complete or anything like that, but it's a quick primer on some of these psychological um, investigations that you might have in regards to interaction and performance. Okay, so, so that's what I'll spend probably the rest of my time talking about. Um, so uh, the first thing I want to point you to is kind of very old work uh, by Bernie the Coven, and some of you might be aware of this, uh, about public play, right? So basically, <clears throat> this is probably back in the 60s, 70s, and at these times, you know, uh, the idea of play was you know, pretty new um, in public, right? But basically, he sets up all these really interesting rules that get people to do uh, really interesting things. And these, you wouldn't think that rules are part of the performance, but actually the rules let people to do performance-like things. And so that's kind of one of the takeaways that I have for myself as well is, for example, in that VR work, the rule of what she's doing inside VR versus what you're seeing outside, that is a rule that you're putting on the situation. And that rule actually allows play and interesting performance to occur, right? Um, so um, the way that uh, Bernie the Coven puts it is that, um, and one of the big takeaways that I think you should have is, in the well-played game, everybody wins. So what does that mean? Um, if you think about sports, right? Um, you know, if your team is not very good, you get better players, and if you get better players, they perform better and they win, right? So in this kind of community, it's different. It's, it's not important that you win. It's actually important that everybody has fun. And in, 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 in our case, that everybody takes away something from the performance and it's interesting and rewarding from the, for them, right? And if it's not fun for them, just change the rules, right? So his uh, you know, big example was he was playing ping pong with his friend, right? His, his, his friend is really good and he's... And, and, and Bernie is like kind of barely a ping pong player. He can kind of just like hit the ball back, right? So uh, after about five minutes of this, his friend is just realizes, okay, so like Bernie is not really a ping pong player. This thing is not really going to be fun. So what uh, they end up doing is like they, they basically put, they change the rule of the game so that they put the paddle on the table and his goal is now to kind of try to hit that ball in that, into that stationary paddle, right? Like over and over again. So it becomes a different game, but who cares? Like it's more fun, right? Um, and so uh, the rules are made up. And so he, if you go online and search for Bernie the Coven, you could see him doing these interesting things. Like there's a game called Patty Cake, which like it's basically random stuff happening, but then he's making up the rules as they go along, right? So this is kind of the spirit that I would love to kind of, you know, experiment with and, and, and have you guys think about. Like these rules are actually flexible and there are things that you can play around with. Now, in terms of the psychology of it, right? So motivation is really important. You know, why are audiences actually interesting, interested in this performance or play, for instance, right? And from psychology, we know that there's kind of three big things, right? There's competence, how well do they do, right? If they don't do very, very well in this, um, or in, in terms of uh, understanding, do they understand what you're going after? Um, uh, if they don't, then it, it won't be very useful for them. And also, you know, are they, is it related to um, their personal lives? 
And then do they have a certain type of autonomy, right? So I guess if you're seeing a play, sometimes you don't necessarily have that sense of autonomy. But if you're seeing a theater performance in person, there's actually at least some sort of interaction that you can feel with the, uh, with the performance. So that gives you a level of autonomy as well. But for interaction, like from something like a game, the autonomy is really key. Um, there's the big point of this intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation. And in, in interaction, that is super in, in important. Right? Especially if your performance is based on audience interaction and how they interpret uh, what you're doing. So um, you should always try to strive for extrinsic, uh, sorry, intrinsic types of uh, uh, motivation. Right? So extrinsic types of motivation are things like, oh, you know, money and grades, you know, things that you get rewarded for, basically. Right? So intrinsic motivation is those things that you would do for free, <laughs> basically. <laughs> things that you would do regardless, right? Um, if you like a certain uh, activity, you are going to intrinsically motivated to do it, right? So there's some really interesting psychological phenomena that I don't have time to go into. But for, for instance, if you reward people for something uh, that they did in a game or things like that, it actually can demotivate them because it would convert the intrinsic motive to extrinsic motive, right? So one kind of famous example, you know, uh, metaphor is like you went to uh, uh, see the movies with your wife, okay, or husband, your significant other. Uh, you come home and then you reward uh, your quote unquote wife, you know, husband by saying that, Oh, thank you very much for going to the movies with us. It was a very entertaining, right? So would you do that? Uh, you probably don't need to do that because your significant other went to the movie with you, not because of the movie, but because they wanted to be with you, right? So by telling them that actually, no, uh, we went because of the movie, you're actually demotivating them to spend time with you, right? Hopefully that makes sense. Um, so, so anyway, so intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation. If it you know, not perfectly understood, that's fine. But the idea is intrinsic is always better, basically in that way. Um, I also want to talk about attention real fast because that's a, probably an even bigger issue if you're in uh, Zoom or things like that, and you're doing these performances, which you think as the performer is like, oh my god, this is really amazing stuff. You guys can check it out, right? But in reality, uh, especially because of Zoom, are people actually paying attention to this, right? People are probably multitasking. They're probably looking at other stuff. You know, hopefully it's not happening right now, right now, but I have no control over that, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, so attention is really important in this new economy now. It's the attention economy. Because I don't need to pay attention to you. You don't have anything on me I can and I don't have to right as an audience member right um, so there's different types of attention there's active attention uh, which is when you're actually doing the task like so for example you're playing basketball you're and it's 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 top down in the way that that the task focuses you, you to do something right so that's active attention uh, guess what? We don't really have that here. We have passive attention, which is bottom up. And, it, and what that means is the environment triggers you to do something, which then captures your attention. Right? So in the analogous case, instead of playing the basketball, which would be active attention, you're watching the basketball game. Right? And your attention can drift anywhere in that case. Right? So for example, you can play a basketball game as you're watching the basketball too, right? <laughs> so you can have divided attention, right? So there's selective attention and there's the divided attention. I don't know if some of you have heard of this thing called the cocktail party effect. Um, I'll explain it real fast, but what that means is actually in a cocktail party, you know, there's all kinds of stuff happening and everybody talking and chatting all the time, right? Um, you, if somebody says your name, immediately you get their attention. You, you get their attention, right? So that's despite the fact that all these things are happening all the time. Like you're not listening for them, right? It's just random noise happening. And then if the random noise consists the string of your name, all of a sudden the cocktail uh, party effect happens, and you pay attention to it, right? And you can 
basically selectively pay attention because of your uh, certain types of triggers. Where if somebody says emergency, get out of here, all of a sudden cocktail party effect kicks over. Um, so very quickly, I want to talk about multitasking because that's something that we deal with all the time now. Um, and so because I'm a neuroscientist, I'm super interested in what's actually happening. Here's what I can tell you. And so this is there's a little bit a lot of detail uh, that. You know, I might have to spend more time if you really understand in detail. But the big takeaway from the study on the multitasking so far in the in the neuroimaging data is that multitasking does not exist. <laughs> That's the best way I can think of it. What that means is, here's what, why I say that. If you give people multitasks, kind of, you know, doing something, you know, in this case, listening to something while driving, for instance, right? They don't actually do that. What they do is they they switch between different tasks. They do task A and then mentally do a very quick switch into task B. And then they switch back to task A and then switch back to task B. Very, very quickly, right? So what that means is in the driving, you're literally driving, listening, driving, listening, driving. <laughs> right? That's actually what's happening in the brain, right? Um, and not only that, you have the... Cognitive resources, cognitive resources that's uh, applying to one task, task A, and the task B. But you're actually in the multitasking. You're actually uh, putting some of that resource into the switching too. So it's actually even more difficult um, uh, to accomplish those tasks, right? So now, the certain things would make it better. For example, you're really practiced at driving, hopefully. So if you're doing something really that you really practice that, you don't need to put as much cognitive resources into that. And therefore the switching part of it also has less, uh, you know, things. So therefore you can pay attention more, more to the listening and therefore, you know, so, so some of that would make it a little bit easier. Um, uh, but that's really what multitasking is. We tell ourselves we're multitasking all the time, but actually we're not. We're just doing A and then we're doing B and then we're switching between the two, right? So. Understanding that is very important, uh, and it's because uh, now we know um, some of the things that um, the you know, audience actually goes through, right? So, so real quickly, guys, so everybody pay attention right now is that we're going to do a real quick task. So you're going to see a bunch of cards, and I, your goal in these cards is to add up the numbers, uh, square them, uh, add up the squares of these numbers and report back to us what the result is. Okay, so here, here we go. You guys ready? Okay, double the value of each card. Add them up. What's the answer? The fast per fastest person wins. You can just put it on the chat if you, as soon as you get it. Okay, we have a winner, Mary. Thank you very much. Um, wow, okay. Let's see if it's the right answer, right? We have a uh, <laughs> conflicting, what's the right answer, folks? What's the right answer? I mean, it's hard because ace can be a couple of values, yeah, depending sure. on what game you're playing. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking of it as, as one, but yeah. Okay, Okay. so that's not the important part. Here's the important part. Did you guys see this? Did anybody see the black heart, which does not physically exist in the, uh, well, shouldn't in the card game? Did anybody, anybody who saw that? Uh, nobody. So uh, guess what's going on? I distracted you into this uh, phenomenon called inattentional blindness, right? Uh, when you're not uh, paying actual attention or you actually engage some, in some very intense attention to do some other thing, guess what? You can present people with all kinds of stuff that they just don't know, don't notice, don't, you know, mind, right? Um, and these are implicit effects and by the way you can do this really well in vr that's something that i actually kind of study as well for example you can do things in the background exactly yeah yeah exactly like uh carrie was saying the invisible gorilla right that well now that you told everybody everybody's gonna see the invisible gorilla but uh yeah you can google that 
Um, uh, but yeah, so that's why I give this one. I don't give the uh, Invisible Gorilla because everybody's seen that one, right? So, um, but uh, but now you guys can't forget this, right? So so in VR, uh, you could do similar things, right? So in the screen, it's a lot harder to get away with it. So I had to kind of get you guys to do some particular specific thing in order to move your attention away. But in the screen, everything is covered. So anything that changes, you can kind of reasonably easily detect that. So the way people get around that is they show up very, very quickly and switch back. So that's the only way they can do it. But in VR, you're not limited to that. Uh, you can show them behind where they're looking, right? Uh, they, they're, they can, they're free to look there, right? Or listen, right? But they don't have to. And so they can miss stuff all the time. And, and so I think, you know, uh, we can get into this in more detail later on when we actually get into things like VR. But one of the powers of VR is not the immersiveness. A lot of people say that, you know, oh, VR is immersive. You can see the whole world. To, for me, the fun thing in VR is the limited perspective because you're looking at some specific place in the, whole, in the same time, in, in any time. And therefore, you can change all kinds of things that's happening and the spatial audio and, you know, etc. So we can get into that in more detail, but, uh, but attention is very important. And, and I, I, want, I hope you guys can, um, you know, just keep that in mind as you uh, get your performances together, right? There are things in your performance that people will miss. So what are those things that you can make, you know, you allow people to miss? And also, what are those things that you can change to surprise people and by the way that they miss it? Okay, so so we can think about that uh, as we keep going along. Um, so uh, interestingly, to capture attention, and this is, you know, just, you know, telling you about it. But if you think about it, it kind of makes sense, is that these different ways of capturing attention actually do different things. So for example, beauty, contrast, elegance, right? Well, that gets attention, but it doesn't necessarily hold on to the attention, right? So as soon as you see that picture, oh, it's really interesting. And then Instagram culture, the next thing that comes up with a beautiful, you know, whatever, uh, you're gonna pay attention to that, right? Now, interactivity and rewards, you know, kind of like game-like situations, it's harder to get the attention because you have to get them to do something, right? You have to get them to, you know, participate in the thing that you want to do. But once you do get them, their attention, it's actually easier to hold on to it because it's kind of addictive, right? Playing video games is kind of addictive because you're trying to get to the, the next level. You're trying to get the next uh, reward, you know. So, so, but what you notice is that the best of both worlds, a story and kind of social interest and relatedness and autonomy and those things that I talked about earlier on, you can get attention with that. Any beautiful, amazing story will capture attention. But you can also hold on to that because you can lead people on with that story. And so therefore, a narratively based approach is, is really behind all the great stuff that you can do with the performance, either explicitly or implicitly. Um, attention and autonomy is also really interesting. Um, so. One thing is, you know, I've been telling you about, okay, how to capture people's attention, et cetera, et cetera. But actually, sometimes you don't necessarily want to do that. You want to allow people to fill in their world in some ways, right? So you're kind of letting them, you're kind of losing the attention to them. Um, so um, this one is a little bit hard to kind of, you know, show by saying. It's more like kind of showing by doing. Um, but, um, but, there are, there are a lot of kind of amazing moments, for example, interactive environments and, and performances where you kind of just lose yourself um, as an audience member. And you lose yourself not because it's amazing view and whatever. You lose yourself because you put in sort of this intrinsic motivation. Like you travel in your imagination in that world. So, for example, if you set something up in a 3D environment for that person, you allow them to identify their own experiences with that environment. Not, not by showing them what the environment is, but by letting their intrinsic motivation take over and therefore be able to, you know, be invested in this world that you created, but they identify with. So that's something to also think about is intrinsic motivation allows you to go beyond just showing them what they are. 
Now this is kind of fuzzy wuzzy. It's hard to, <laughs> you know, it's it's going to be different from every for everybody as well. Uh, but that's some something that you can keep in mind. Um, oh, any any questions, suggestions before we uh, talk about the last couple of topics? I have been going on and on, so therefore we need to have your intrinsically motivated attention back. <laughs> Okay, well, we can talk about it in the, in the Q&A as well. Um, so uh, the kind of the last bit uh, I want to take spend time on is uh, the idea of perception. So this is uh, uh, a, f a fairly well-known kind of uh, 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 manga by uh, Scott McCloud. Um, so he notices basically the following. So if you look at comics um, uh, from, you know, the Western style, you know, kind of Marvel, to the Eastern style, you know, like in Japanese comics, right? Um, he noticed that there's really different things that are happening, different types of storytelling that's happening. So first I show you kind of this Western style, which consists of a lot of these kind of scene transitions that you might see a lot, like moment to moment, action to action, you hit the ball and the ball goes somewhere else, right? So explicit declaration of what's happening. Um, what he knows is that in the Eastern comics, you don't see that. So this is the kind of example of a Eastern comic, right? Uh, you see, <laughs> you know, the sun, sleep, two people sleeping, and then, you know, kind of a scene transition into something that kind of sort of makes sense, but doesn't necessarily, it's kind of like scattered brain, like, you know, kind of perception-driven types of things, right? So you don't see that as much as, the, as the, in, the, in the Western comic. But what that actually is, is kind of environmental storytelling. He's, he, you know, the, the, the comic drawer, uh, comedian, <laughs> that's not the right word, you know, the creator of the comic um, is actually using this kind of art of omission to allow you to, to, to kind of jump through the, the different... Uh, basically allow you to imagine what's happening in between the frames, right? And so this is what I was talking about early on with uh, autonomy and, and the t attention, is that a lot, a lot of times you have to allow people to make up their own story based on the limited information. And the, the more limited the information, sometimes the more effective uh, the ambiguity. So, you know, it's kind of a trade-off. Um, and so in terms of the neuroscience, this is why I'm here, right, the neuroscience. So in terms of neuroscience, what I can tell you is actually implicitly, you know, these kind of, uh, you know, these hints that you're giving them is actually really big in the psychology literature in actually being able to uh, influence uh, uh, the, the cognitive processing, right? So there's a very uh, big field called uh, priming, semantic priming, um, implicit memory right so what people do in this field is uh, they basically either show a word or show a picture before the actual uh, stimulus so the stimulus in this case is the word love right so they'll, they'll give you a fixation point which is where you're going to be looking they show you very very quickly like too brief to be processed by uh, actual um, uh, active attention uh, the word win or some picture and then they give you the word love right now if, you, if they gave you the priming, you're actually faster to respond to the fact of, of the love, basically, like in the choice experiment, for example. So basically, by using the priming, they can actually increase or decrease uh, the reaction time that you use to, uh, on the actual stimulus itself. For example, like they can actually give you that hateful, in, in a hateful image for the word love, and then you'll be slower to choose love on the subsequent uh, you know, stimulus, right? So that's important, right? So you can actually even do negative priming. Is is negative priming is where you the, the thing that you ignored is the thing that you try not to choose on the next. It's getting a little bit more complicated, but but the idea basically is like these very brief presentations before actually affects how you uh, process information later on. So some of this is, a lot of this is actually completely. Uh, unaware. You don't even know what's happening. It's kind of like you're watching a movie and, you know, they show the very brief clip of the Coke, uh, you know, the Coke, and then they lead, you know, and then they show you this, like, really James Bond, you know, whatever kind of, you know, macho moment, you know, whatever it is. 
and they're kind of trying to associate with you know what a product with that well actually what they're doing is actually they're doing and companies pay, pay big big money in movies in order to advertise their product in that way to associate it with a positive uh, thing right it's happening all the time and actually once you see it you can't really unsee it so when I watch a movie it's like oh, okay here's a BMW commercial you know <laughs> so um, lastly um, some of you might know this work but um, there's a book by Robert Cialdini and it's kind of related to what we're talking about in terms of um, persuading people to uh, do certain things but what you notice is that basically his kind of weapons of influence and these are kind of strategies for influencing people to do different things um, is actually a lot of times implicit right so for example consistency well that's how you set up the environment they don't you don't necessarily tell them anything uh, they're kind of forced to kind of enact their own situation right so we don't have time to go through all of these weapons of influence but we can uh, talk about that and how it relates to performance in general when you're trying to keep things in a consistent manner and you can actually you don't have to keep everything consistent they will follow your consistency using implicit influence for example yeah, I know. It's kind of funny that, well, the reason they said that it's called weapons um, uh, for Mary um, is because um, he wants to point you out to the fact that they are destruct, like they, they have a very powerful and destructive influence. I think that's, that's why he wants to call it weapons. And by saying that it's weapon, it's a weapon, it's making your mind understand them in such a way that it's a threat. So, so actually, Calling it weapons of influence is a way for him to implicitly influence you to kind of understand this as a, you know, major concern that people do. You know, he actually went and became a, a car salesman in order to learn these strategies. You know, um, I can tell you about it more in, in the, in the Q&A and whatever, but um, so that's persuasion. Uh, so very, very last thing, because uh, I think I'm out of time. I just want to get to the Q&A. Um, so I have two more slides, uh, if you bear with me. Um, and, and here's the last two things I want to say. So uh, one thing is performance can be thought of as an interactive experience in a world that you create for them. Because everything you, tur you churn out, um, be it VR, be it in a film, be it anything you want, and sometimes it's harder with Zoom. Um, but everything you give is a view, a vision of this world. It's a vision of your world, in fact. And my entire presentation so far, what you see behind me, the slides, the graphics of the slides, it's trying to tell you something about who I am in a little, in a way, right? <laughs> Meta-analysis, right? And so the story isn't necessarily what you tell people. In fact, in the psychology studies, I can tell you in more detail later on, the story is usually not what you tell them, in fact. Because people, if you tell them something, they put that in the side of like, okay, this is something they are trying to tell me. But what people actually fall in love with and love is the thing that you're not telling them, but they're picking up using intrinsic means. Okay, um, so the story is established by the framing. The narrative is in the environment that you're setting it up. And it's probably more difficult in some ways in Zoom because there's just less affordances for that to happen. But in VR, there probably is more that you can do. So, you know, we can think about how that would affect the performances, right? Um, and the responses that people have are very improvised, right? So it's improvised because it's based on the world and they discover how it's related to them in the world that you're setting it up. So as a storyteller, basically the last slide that we have is, as a storyteller, you're sometimes just giving them a world that they can explore. They don't necessarily have you follow you on that. It's actually more powerful if they can relate to their own uh, situation and their lives. And so if there's any takeaway from me, um, uh, on my section, number one, I hope you remember my work with the VR and 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 the decertain five, you know, hopefully, and tell all your friends about it. I would love it if you do that. But um, on the um, side of you know, hopefully, helping you uh, with um, with um, 
you know, as we keep going on as well about about um, how it affect you know, your performance and your strategies, is to keep in mind these two things. Um, only two things. One, um, implicit interactions are super important. Uh, you don't necessarily have to tell them specifically. Sometimes it's the world that you build in, right? And number two, make sure um, uh, you think about the audience's uh, intrinsic uh, motives, right? Think about the different, uh, if they're different audience members, where they're from, how they would relate to your work in their way. And it's not about, you know, extrinsically rewarding them for something that they accomplished, but actually intrinsic rewards. And so this whole process is collaborative, just like in a theater, I think. Um, if you go see a play, everything is sort of a negotiation between a, a audience member and, and, you know, maybe play is a little bit less, but, you know, a comedy show, right? That's totally like that where everything is a collaboration. Oh, this joke's not funny. I'm going to tell that other one, <laughs> right? So um, everything is collaborative. Everything is negotiable. And if you keep those two big ideas in mind, um, uh, and if you want to geek out on some of the more psychology stuff, and I'm happy here to, to help you um, and, and involve you with that. Um, uh, so those, those are two, the, the two big ways, uh, the two big takeaways. Um, so let me just give you my kind of uh, thank you very much slide. So I don't have time to uh, talk about this, but I actually do some work with uh, spatial influence, etc. as well. Uh, that's what my lab in City University of Hong Kong will be doing as well. Um, and then the other two projects, if you want to go check it out on, on my website, or actually this might, this might only be on, uh, this particular one might only be on uh, Vimeo. You, you can find it though, uh, is to use... Um, uh, wearable devices to uh, perform, basically wearable devices that make music. Um, so that's one, that's called Creative Flow, that was presented at Deconstruct. And then the other project is probably a long, more along the lines of what I do more as a, as a machine learning, you know, creative technologist artist. And this one is called uh, Secret Lives of Machines, that's also on that website um, you can find. Um, and that's using machines to actually do performance actually. Um, I'll just leave it at that. I'll let you guys fill in the blanks. Right? Secret lives machines. Ooh, what is that? Right. Okay, so yeah. Uh, thank you very much. These are the folks who are supporting me, etc. And then I uh, would love to get to into the discussion part, which is usually the more fun part uh, as well. So thank you very much.